Hi, right, I'm Paul Hobbs. I'm an artist. I make painting and sculpture and explore a number of social issues and faith themes through my work and use lots of different materials. So the styles that I use include a lot of painting but also collage, literally using newspaper articles and headlines in my work. I, use, I have used wood and steel um, at different times um, and use lots of other some objects in my work, found objects. So really it starts with what's the idea, what's the purpose of the project, what am I trying to do? And, uh, and then I sort of think about the materials that might be appropriate to use. Mm -hmm. And often it's the sort of the juxtaposition or the confrontation of one material with another that actually generates the excitement visually and maybe disturbs the, the viewer in terms of th making them ask questions about how does that fit with that, why is that yeah. against that. Um, so, for example, I did a, an exhibit in response to the killings in Rwanda about 12 or 15 years ago, and um, there I got a full-size machete and put it in, into a, a red box with a glass front which said, in emergency, break, break glass across the front. Um, and so, you know, and then next to it was a text um, with a little red frame, and it was a series of instructions which was a direct parody of fire instructions but then the words have been changed to fear. So it was all about, sort of, um, in, in the event of fire, it was in the event of fear or suspicion, mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. these things. Um, so, I mean, that's a sort of an example where I'm taking an object, I'm, I'm really taking another idea that one's seen around in the world, but subverting it or changing yeah. its natural, sort of, uh, the way it's seen normally. Um, so it's more of an intellectual idea there, yeah. fusing, fusing something you've seen around with, with some political issue. Um, compared to a number of artists, fairly diverse, if you come to a show of, of mine, um, you will find paintings, you know, many abstract paintings, but you also find others with more symbolic imagery, and you'll find objects like, let's say, that machete piece, yeah. um, occasionally in boxes. You'll find things where I've used text and printed onto objects. Um, and the subject matter can be quite varied as well. So it can look as if you're viewing the work by six artists in, in you know, any one of my yeah. shows usually. And that's because of the diversity of materials that I'm using. And, and that I switch back and forth. I don't necessarily um, do something and then that's it, I never return to it again. I may yeah. come back and use that style or that imagery again. Um, so. But I think what holds my work together, bizarrely, is actually what I would say fragmentation. Right. The way that I'm making lots of things out of bits and pieces, yeah. um, even with the abstract work. And that there are lots of layers in the work. There are layers of meaning, but there might literally be layers of paint or, or other kinds of layers going on in the work. Yeah. So I think, yeah, bizarrely, that's what holds my work together, I think, is yeah. fragmentation. With this one, I'm, I'm celebrating patterns in, in flowers, in this case, a, a laurel bush. Um, and so I'm laying down a series of big shapes across the hole, blocking yeah. them in with various colours, and then projecting another image over the top and selecting shapes from it and drawing around them yeah. and creating crisscross patterns and everything else. And then I'm blocking in more colours and then at a certain point I get lost within it all and uh, maybe the colours are fighting each other and it's all becoming a bit confusing. Yeah. So then I tend to put a thin layer of a colour across the whole of it, deadening the brighter colours, yeah. sort of softening the deeper colours, but it gives it a unity. Yeah. And then I go back into it and pick out certain sections of colours. So at some point I found these sort of purples, yellows and whites that I really liked and the emerald green in the section somewhere on the picture and decided, great, I will take those colours and reproduce them across the whole yeah. to unify it. So if you like fusing again, yeah. I'm trying to bring the thing together again, uh, against the background of all these fighting shapes and surfaces. Yeah. Um, and so then I had to sort of work back and think, how do I get that colour into there? Well, I might, yeah. might have to paint the white in first and the yellow at the top and then the green over the top of that in order to get that surface mm -hmm. colour that I want. Mm -hmm. um, so it's understanding what's going on in the picture and replicating that part of it across the whole to give it a unity. Another piece which involved using you know, lights uh, on 
was was my piece Holy Ground, mm -hmm. which is a sort of large circle laid on the floor with Hessian sacking and some stones scattered, and then around it are pairs of shoes arranged um, facing towards the centre. But in the centre is a stainless steel sort of sculpted tree, mm. quite sort of simple. Yeah. But a sculpted tree, and and then there are lights added, which are aimed at that tree, and they flicker and reflect off it, mm -hmm. and that's sort of changing and moving all the time. Yeah. So you've got a different dynamic with that, and you get beautiful shadows on the walls um, from the tree, but also they're they're coloured pinks and purples and and blues and things, depending on what the lights are doing. Mm -hmm. So you're there's something else going on there with the the emotive factor of of the colours mm. that are changing instead of being static. Yeah. Um, so, so that would be, you know, an exciting thing. Um, another time, I did a sort of performed piece where I had made a sculpture which was made out of slotted pieces of wood, and with a piece of music playing for about five minutes, I assembled the sculpture um, in a particular way. Which, if you like, the the sculpture is is always worth looking at right from the beginning it's mm. not you're waiting for it to be finished you're, mm. you know, there's something there at the beginning but it's changing um, and what it is is you've got lots of shapes that are being pushed apart and in the center another shape is rising up mm. in the middle of it um, so you know people have seen that and found it quite emotive mm. it's difficult for me because I've always been doing it I haven't mm. sort of mm. been able to stand back and see what it looks like with me actually in the way almost mm. Mm. as this sculpture is being built yeah um, but but certainly would explore that. Awesome. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I think, I suppose I don't sort of consciously think about it as mm. fusion and trying out different things. It's almost like that. It's something that you just do, mm. and it it depends on the the possibilities that you've got. Sometimes who you can work with, mm. and um, what your budget is as yeah. to what's possible. As much as your idea, but I think the the great thing was when I sort of discovered at art college that actually art can be about anything <laughs> you know and the materials can be anything that, yeah. that you're prepared to work with and uh, there are so many different ways to do it and it's just really exciting yeah so the main limits tend to be your own imagination mm. or the materials that you're able to get your hand on mm. or even the dedication that you know the amount of drive you can be prepared to put to it yeah. if I'm working with steel I, I work with a blacksmith yeah. who you know I can design something and yeah. because I don't work with steel a lot um, th this particular blacksmith has been very helpful on two, two largest projects that I've done. Yeah. So the first case he taught me how to make the first one, the second one I designed the thing and he mm. made it. Mm. And we did, I kept a look, went along and sort of checked what he was doing and yeah. adjusted it accordingly. Yeah. Um, so, so that would be how I might work with him. Yeah. Um, with sound or uh, something like that I would need to talk to other people and see mm. how that would work. Um, but I have, you know, a friend who does a lot of, sort of sound recordings of things mm. so I would first go to talk to him mm. and see what's possible and see sure. if he's interested sure. um, or you know if you ever worked out some dance thing it would be yeah. exciting if that yeah, was uh, yeah. going to be you know mutually profitable yeah um, so the key thing is to sort of dream up ideas and talk around with people and then see what's possible and how you can yeah. make it work I think you've always got to be careful of how whatever you're making is going to be understood by the viewer. I mean, some artists don't think too hard about the, the viewer, um, and there can be legitimate reasons for that, I suppose. But my purpose in a lot of my work is to stimulate people to think about a particular idea. So I want to make sure that that idea comes across to some degree or other. Mm. You know, you don't want to pitch just for the sort of the lowest common denominator and make yeah. it so easy that it's boring. Yeah. Um, so you want it to be stimulating and challenging. That's where the sort of the, the fusion idea, the throwing in lots of things into the mix, can be very exciting and uh, a little a little challenging and disturbing for people. Um, and I think this the skill is to know just how much to load up the images or the ideas in the work mm -hmm. so that you can expect that say the average person will get 60% of it and the really sharp person might get 95% yeah. of it because they're trained in arts they know how to look at the clues and everything else yeah. so you don't want to sort of um, just please one group or other yeah you want to have 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 it really carefully worked and crafted yeah um, for, for the people who, who 
know how to look if you like and for yeah. the others you're trying to give them the gist of it and also you're trying to help them learn how to get the most out of it in yeah. the future yeah. um, one of the other things I've begun to appreciate not least through through meeting friends who are actors and, and dancers and so on is that visual art or fine art operates differently from nearly all other art forms and in a particular way and that is that it's not time-based usually I mean, mm. it can be if you do mm. a performance but but a painting or a sculpture or an installation is usually static it stays there in one place and if it's still there at the end of the week exactly the same the viewers may come and go but it remains yeah. and I think that means that the way the art operates is is quite distinct and you can come up and look up look at a piece of artwork and, and explore it but you may not understand it at all and you go away and you know and so on with a piece of a performed piece of work like yeah. a dance or a film yeah. or, or a theatre show it starts you watch this thing happen at the end you know it's finished yeah and um, you may not understand it um, but it, it happened and uh, with fine art it's all got to be sort of designed at the beginning all the ideas are within that work and then the viewer comes to see it with a, with a performed thing there's something that the performer can actually do to try and get the audience to engage in a yeah. particular way yeah. and um, they may not change what they do but it, but it's something to do with the size of it or repeating something or whatever it is they've got the option to do that mm. on the other hand in most cases the audience doesn't have a chance to engage to interact or engage they can't say to the dancer could you do that again i didn't didn't see that bit mm. or what was that line louder please mm. um you can't do that you can't stop the film and that rewind. doesn't happen very often though anyway in performance does it that somebody would say can you do that again no no no, no. because you know yeah it wouldn't be possible yeah so so that's the thing whereas the advantage of fine art yeah. is actually the viewer is in control they can look at the mm. exhibition in the order that they choose to, they can look at the red one first and the green one after, or the big ones, or the, whatever it is they mm, like. Mm. They can whiz around very quickly and then go back to the three or four they want to watch, look at really carefully. Yeah. They can stand in front of it with their friend and be very critical yeah. discussing it. They can uh, listen to other people's views. Um, they can come back tomorrow, look at it again. It's still there. Yeah. So the viewer actually has much more sense of control. Yeah. with how they engage with the work than they would in any performed piece um, and I think that's it's, it's just different it's an advantage and a disadvantage mm. that the artist, the visual artist has to actually work with mm. and uh, I find that sort of quite exciting and I think that's where sculptures to my mind slightly have the edge on a painting mm. because it's literally in the way the viewer has to walk in and has to recognise it and negotiate walking around it mm. whereas the painting is on the wall and you can just keep going down the corridor mm. and not really look um, so but I enjoy that that sense of sort of setting things up and getting people to pause and stop and mm. look mm. which again is different from the performed thing once mm. that film is running once that theatre is going you know people are going to look mm. whereas the art exhibit first of all has to get people's attention mm. Mm. and then you hope that they will explore and unpick the layers that are in it mm. but you've got to fight for their attention at the beginning as well yeah